In this lecture, we're looking at Luther and the antinomian controversy. And we can begin by talking about just the reason for this lecture and the focus of it. There are really two reasons why we need to discuss what Luther says about antinomianism. In the first place, we have noticed periodically throughout these lectures that not everyone agreed with Luther and his views on various matters. We noticed how Zwingli differed with Luther on the subject of the Lord's Supper. And when we get to the end of this course and we discuss the theology behind that, we'll notice that there are actually a number of ways that Zwingli and Luther differed. We've also seen how some of the apocalyptic folks in the 1520s differed with Luther on the subject of violence and the overthrow of the established order, both in terms of politics and in terms of the peasants, to throw off the wages system that they had known for so long. And they hoped to put everything in common in a sort of early modern version of socialism. Well, there are actually a number of other people who differ with Luther on a number of things. And in this lecture, we're going to be looking at Ioannis Agricola, another one of these men who actually was very close to Luther personally. He taught for a period of time in Wittenborg and was actually from Luther's hometown. But Agricola eventually differs with Luther on the subject of the law in the Christian life. But the other reason for this lecture is that, in a somewhat ironic twist, it's often very hard to pin Luther down on just what he believes on some of the most important subjects of his Reformation. In the case of law gospel, at the really heart of both Lutheran preaching and of the Lutheran understanding of justification, you don't really get substantial, what we might call systematic exposition of these doctrines. Rather, what you often find is you have to triangulate as to what Luther believes based on any given moment. Now, anyone who has read through the vast majority of Luther's writings and who has studied his life can come to a pretty close conclusion as to what Luther believed in the main. It's not as if he wrote nothing on these subjects. But when it comes to some of the more finer nuances as to what he believed, at times the polemics of Luther can overtake a more systematic or careful exploration of what he believed. Even to this day, there are people who differ as to what Luther's primary views on certain either primary doctrines or secondary doctrines was. Now, don't overplay that point. It's not as if it's all just sort of up for grabs. But I've found, usually through teaching through Luther, that there's more often than not, at least at the student level, impressions as to what Luther taught rather than actual awareness of the things that he said which I think is something like we're reading our more contemporary debates about justification or the use of the law or these kinds of things back into Luther. And so in this case, we're actually going to look at one of the more important times in which Luther says things that, at least at the surface level, don't appear very Lutheran. <laughs> and more importantly, that the man on the opposite side of Luther on this issue of antinomianism, I find, tends to sound very much like how people characterize Luther's understanding of justification. Well, what is the debate here? What is the issue? Well, antinomianism, of course, is the belief that the Christian is no longer under law. Now, we're going to nuance exactly what antinomianism is by the end of this lecture, but the basics of it, the etymology of it, if you will, is that nomos, law in Latin, is something that is now abrogated. An antinomian is someone who says Christians no longer live under the law. Now, right there, again, you'll see that the very common caricature of Luther's views would often have it that Luther is opposed to law. Well, here in this lecture, we're going to begin to nuance and shade our understanding of exactly what Luther means by the law. But in this case, we're looking at it from the historical lens. And as we've said, when we get to the last third of this course, we're actually going to look at this in terms of the systematic or theological perspective when we discuss what the third use of the law is for Luther. But for right now, we're looking at the historical lens. And the historical lens is really brought about by the presence of one man, Ioannis Agricola. Agricola was born on April 20th, 1494, in the city of Eisleben. Now, if you recognize that name, of course, that is the city where Luther spent a significant number of years of his youth. Agricola comes from the same town, you might say. And that's actually important because one of the things that will be sort of a mystery in this problem in Wittenborg and beyond is that Luther, for a time, holds back in terms of his attacking of Agricola's position. And he brings him back to Wittenborg, and Luther, only quite late in the process, writes openly against Agricola. 
There does seem to be some sort of personal affinity, in other words, between Luther and Agricola that kind of undermines the normal process for Luther, in which once he senses that there's someone who is opposed to him, he lashes out pretty aggressively. This, by the way, is true also of Melanchthon, who we'll look at in a later lecture. There are a number of points where Melanchthon and Luther seem to disagree, at least in terms of the finer shadings of their points. And there are times when Melanchthon disagrees with Luther on very key points. But Melanchthon's his guy, and Luther, to the day he died, would say nothing of ill of his friend. Well, for Agricola, he kind of is under that umbrella as well for Luther, at least for a short time. Well, Agricola was originally intended, or he desired, to study medicine. But it's actually through Luther's intervention, after he becomes a Protestant, that Luther convinces him to consider the study of theology instead. Agricola studied actually for a period of time at the University of Wittenberg, there while Luther is a professor. And in fact, he was actually with Luther at some of the key moments of the Reformation. He actually traveled with Luther to the Leipzig Disputation, where he served as a secretary, in fact. Which means that the first-hand accounts we have from the Lutheran side of the Leipzig Disputation are actually the product of Agricola's work. Well, we can't ignore the personal factor here in terms of Agricola's eventual challenge of Luther's doctrines. Sometime around 1525, it seems that Agricola wanted the chair of theology at the University of Wittenberg, and he was passed over and it fell to someone else. Within a relatively short period of time, Agricola leaves Wittenberg then. He first takes a pastorate in Frankfurt, and he actually leaves that in a month's time because the Latin school at Eisleben, the school actually where Luther had studied, has a job opening and they hire Agricola to come back to his hometown where he can teach. Well, it's in the context of his engagement there at Eisleben that Agricola begins to develop some real deep concerns about the use of the law in the Christian life. There were some people in the city of Eisleben who were in name Protestant, but Agricola found them troubled people who affirmed that after the conversion of a person, after they had come to justification by faith, they continued to insist on the use of the law in the Christian life. They continued to, for example, impose moral obligations on people, or they talked about discipline of folks within the city. And around this time, Agricola seems to find this a bit jarring. In his mind, the Lutheran doctrine of justification, the views that he'd heard expressed by Luther in Wittenberg and at the city of Leipzig in the disputation there, had talked incessantly about the abrogation of the law, or that the Christian has freedom from the law. And yet here were Protestants touting the law as the core conviction of the Christian life, as the thing that could be a measuring stick for discipline. If people break the law, they can be held to account, for example. And Agricola at this point begins to develop a number of views that he thinks are synonymous with the Lutheran gospel. Namely, he starts to challenge whether or not the law should even be brought up at all in the Christian life. And we're going to get to what he means by that in just a minute. But we need to notice that the initial sort of break with some of his views in terms of the past, or at least the expansion of some of his views, takes place in the context of his experience with folks that he finds abhorrent, or at least problematic in the way that they apply the law to the Christian life. And at the core of it, Agricola says that the law has no bearing on the life of the Christian personally. In fact, he has a quote that he says at this time, in which he says that the law, the moral law itself, is, quote, for the courthouse and not for Christians. Now, exactly what he means by this is a bit striking. Obviously, in this day and age, the courthouse could oversee and take part in things that you or I would consider outside of the jurisdiction of the courthouse. You could, for example, be arraigned in civil court for adultery. So it is a bit of a mystery as to what he means by this. If you're free from the law and you commit adultery, and yet you get rung up in civil court, it's a bit hard to decide what the distinction is that Agricola is making. But he is making one. He's making a rather hard one. He's arguing that the Christian is no longer to even really be concerned with the law at all. Everything, he says, is grace. Well, it's around this time while he's at Eisleben that Agricola begins to say some things in opposition to the Lutheran Reformation that will come home to roost in about a decade. Around this time, Melanchthon had played a role with the German princes that were Lutheran in developing some what we call visitation rules. That is to say, the German princes 
were to go around to the various cities and locations, and using these rules, which were based, frankly, on the law of the Old Testament, they were to measure to what extent the pastors were abiding by these rules. Now, there's a lot of complexity there. Politicians going into cities and measuring the quality of the moral sanctity of pastors is in and of itself a problem, at least to modern ears. But Agricola found in this a more substantive issue, which is, why are you gauging and measuring pastors according to their moral fidelity to the law? Didn't we just preach justification by faith? Why in the world, Agricola asks, would we hold pastors to account in this way? And so he already begins to sort of express some doubts and concerns about the way the Lutheran church is applying the law to pastors and Christians. Well, in 1536, Luther actually invites Agricola back to Wittenberg. There is again the sort of olive branch or the offer to Agricola that he will be slated for the chair of theology. And Agricola does return, but within the span of a few years, he and Luther go at it again. And Melanchthon, of course, is not far behind. Well, the issue here, again, is that Agricola more aggressively comes out against the law's use in the Christian life. He says that the Christian should not talk about law or duty or any of these obligations that we normally associate with the Christian's understanding of the law. And it comes to a head enough that actually in 1540, Agricola flees from Wittenberg, not under pain of death or under arrest, but simply to avoid the ongoing controversy. Well, the reason, the primary reason why he flees is because a year before, in 1539, Luther published his tract or his book against Agricola. And that book is called Against the Antinomians. And so Agricola feels that he is now under pressure, under fire. Luther has now come out against him aggressively. And so he flees to the court of Brandenburg, where he lives the remainder of his life under the umbrella of that prince and away from the city of Wittenberg. Well, what did Luther say in the book Against the Antinomians that forced Agricola to flee? Well, a couple of things can be said about this book to kind of give it some context. Agricola was not the only one who was surprised that Luther and Melanchthon and others still held the law in high regard. They still talked about the obligations of the Christian law. Also, when this book comes out, it's actually Luther who gives us the phrase antinomians. It's a word that he actually coins. He gives it to us in terms of the theological vocabulary that we use all the way down until today. Also, Luther is really combating something of a caricature of what he believes about the law. And so, in many ways, this book is a corrective to the things that were being said about Luther's teachings, rather than some new venture or some new direction that Luther is taking. Okay, if that's the context, what does all this mean? What is the law? Why is Luther going against Agricola? At first response, it seems that Luther is undermining the very doctrines that he started the Reformation for. It would seem, at least according to the popular understanding of it today, that Agricola is the better Lutheran than Luther. Well, it all comes down to the fact that for Luther and for all Protestants, they actually discussed what they call the three uses of the law. Now, this language is not there in the book against the antinomians. And in fact, it takes some time, actually, even after Luther's death, for the so-called three uses of the law debate to really take on a shape where people have a shared vocabulary. But you should know that Calvinists, and Calvin himself, in fact, as well as later Lutherans, carry on a long-standing debate about the, quote, third use of the law. Well, what's happening with Agricola in the context of Luther's life is he has confused what Luther considers to be, first of all, the uses of the law, and then secondly, the place of the law in the Christian life. But let's go through this relatively briefly. Again, in a later lecture on Luther and the third use of the law, we're going to look at this issue theologically within Luther with far more substance. But we need to see this in the context of the 1530s all the way up to 1540. The issue here is is that Luther, first and foremost, even to the day he died, still believes that in terms of outward moral sort of societal issues, that the law still has weight and bearing. Luther will, to the day he die, never say that justification by faith is some prop by which to get at the full breakdown of Christian values or morals or law that's applied to the Christian life. To help students, I often call this the Chick-fil-A rule, (laughs) which is 
if you were to get hungry on Sunday and you were to go out looking for a chicken sandwich and you were to drive to a Chick-fil-A and go to the drive-thru, they, of course, would be closed. Well, usually when people are asked, why does Chick-fil-A close on Sunday? The answer that is given is that it's biblical law. It's part of the biblical message to take Sabbath off. Well, what they're not saying, of course, is that all of their employees that work for Chick-fil-A, because they get Sabbath off, are somehow following the law or applying the law in the sense that it's the thing that drives us to Christ. Rather, they're referring to the law in a different way, what we call today the first use of the law, which is the civil use of the law. And in Luther's day, it was very common to describe how God's law is a restraint on society as a whole. So whenever an organization today in the modern world, to keep that analogy going, decides to close on Sunday, it has nothing to do with the cross or the atonement or faith in Christ. Rather, it has to do with the civil use of the law, that is to say, applying the law in a way that sort of governs, guides, and holds people back. Agricola does sort of signal this when he says that the law is for the courtroom. He's basically saying that the law can only really function in this way of restraining society as a whole. While the other use of the law, in terms of justification, is the other issue for Luther, because in that case, the law functions as the thing that shows us our inability to save ourselves. It shows us our sin. This is frequently called the second use of the law. That is to say, it's the law that is a mirror. It holds up before us all the sins in our lives and shows us how inadequate we are, and it drives us to the cross because we need a Savior. It's this use of the law, frankly, that Paul is talking about in Romans. The law came, it showed me my sin, but now there is a righteousness from Christ that is revealed. Well, this really gets to the heart of the matter for Luther. Because setting aside the civil use of the law, Luther, in terms of his preaching, does not believe in grace-only preaching. When it comes to the second use of the law, the preaching use of the law, you might say, he is law, gospel, not just simply gospel. Now, this is subtle, but it's important. What Agricola is basically saying is once someone comes to faith, they really need to stop putting the law up as the mirror in front of themselves. They need to stop talking about the moral obligations that are required of people. You need to stop lying. You need to stop cheating. You need to stop being angry. Agricola believes that once you've come to the point of justification, that these types of condemnations, these types of moments where the law shows us our sin, should stop. But here's the thing. That's not Luther's doctrine of justification. Luther's doctrine of justification is that the law continues to function this way. That is to say, if you go to a Lutheran sermon, if you go to hear Luther preach in 1535, let's say, ideally, in terms of the hermeneutic that he's applying, Luther will preach law gospel. That is to say, the obligations of Christians are always held out first. Here is your guilt. Here's where you've fallen short. Here's the problems. Luther always refers to this as the whisperings of the doubts of the devil, that you hear the law and you think, oh no, I cannot live up to this. I feel inadequate. I feel unable. And then, according to Lutheran homiletics, you transition then to the application of the gospel. Look to Christ. Grab onto him. Stand before the cross and realize that all of those guilty feelings you felt when you heard the law preached now come freely and effortlessly before the cross and cast them down because those guilty complexes, those guilty feelings, the inadequacy that you feel is taken care of here. Now maybe you'll see why Luther cares about not being antinomian. This idea that Agricola has that you arrive at one point and then the law just simply vanishes denies the fact that Luther believes that you are at the same time saved and sinner, that the entirety of the Christian life is that you go on sinning. And so the role of the pastor in the church, or what the Christian is supposed to hear repeatedly, is here's the law, you do not measure up, and here's the gospel. It's okay. But what Agricola wants is just simply grace preaching constantly. He wants to hear nothing of the condemnation for the remainder of his Christian life. He wants to simply let it go. And it's for this reason that antinomianism is sometimes called cheap grace. It's grace and goodwill 
without first the pain of the thing that makes the good news so good. Now, I've had all kinds of students, again, they read Luther and they come back and they say, I I thought he was a big grace guy. I've also had students attend modern Lutheran churches. And they say, boy, they really talked a lot about law. They spent half the sermon telling me about how wrong I was. (laughs) I thought this was the Lutheran church. Well, you have to understand, for Luther himself, it's law first in the sense that it holds up the mirror and tells you your sin. It's not just simply grace, 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 but rather grace comes whenever the terror of the law comes. Now, when we get to the later lecture on Luther in the third use of the law, this is the issue where we talk about, does Luther believe that you actually can use the law to affect moral change within you? And on that, Luther will be pretty negative. Now, he doesn't sort of live according to the categories as we now have them, but for Luther, sanctification or the change that is wrought in the Christian life by the Spirit is law first as a terrorizing mechanism, followed by the enormous grace of the gospel. But here's the thing. Luther works hard to get to the gospel. Law must come first, the descriptions of our inadequacies. And so when Luther looks at Agricola, who talks incessantly about getting rid of this law, what Luther is hearing when he hears that is that the very mechanism that makes the gospel so sweet and the very mechanism that drives us continually to the cross, the law, is no longer something that Agricola wants in the Christian life. And so when Luther comes out against the antinomians, he's not coming out necessarily against moral change, nor is he taking some kind of legalistic right-hand churn. He's not pulling back, in other words, from the essential core of his teachings on the law and the gospel. Rather, what he is is he's doubling down on them. Well, Agricola goes off in 1540, and he spends the remainder of his life in the court of Brandenburg. And so Luther, against the antinomians, against Agricola, is mostly an issue of how the gospel is preached. Okay, that's it. Next, we're going to be looking at Luther and politics. Another one of these torturous misconceptions of Luther, where there's all kinds of modern debates about Luther and the Nazis and these kinds of things. But we're going to try to clarify and understand what was Luther's role with the political order. (laughs) 